for me to give to you that he has a limited supply of books today thanks to the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, or no thanks to the U.S. Postal Service, we'll say. But he is willing to um, collect. Thanks. Um, I suppose I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I started keeping bees back in 1974, what a lot of old beekeepers like to call the golden age of beekeeping. You know, we threw them in a box and tried to keep them from swarming. And that was pretty much beekeeping. Um, there have been a lot of things that have come along since then. Viruses, pests, mites, um, small hive beetles, chalk brood. Um, it has gotten harder. But the funny thing is, I think uh, a lot of the reason it's gotten harder is the things we keep trying to do to fix it. Sebride's um, law is uh, a leading cause of problems and solutions. <laughs> and um, it's interesting to me recently to see more and more research on on the ecology of the hive, on the microbes that are living in the hive, on the, and nobody really. I Martha Gilman back in the seventies did a little research on this, and it was kind of one of those things that the rest of the research scientists sort of looked at and said, "Well, that's nice," and just moved on with what they were doing. And she did some research on what lived in the gut of the bee and whether it made them more or less susceptible to some of the diseases they were facing at the time, AFB and some of these things, and, and pretty much concluded that, that, that killing off the microbes in the hive was a bad idea. But nobody really paid any attention to it because things weren't collapsing and they just kept running and moving. Now I see about four or five studies recently published and a whole bunch of researchers working on looking at what's going on in the hive from the point of view of it being more than just bees. You know? And, and that's really kind of where I ended up. I just had kept bees pretty much by letting them be bees. I had them in my backyard. I kept them. They were doing fine. Then they all died from varroa. And I didn't really know why they died. I got some more bees and they died. And then I finally figured out it was varroa. And then nobody was offering any solution for varroa other than putting more, other than putting chemicals in the hive. And I, I just couldn't deal with that. I, I suppose a lot of it is your own philosophy of life. And my philosophy of life tends to be that that everything's connected, everything's tied together, and, and that uh, if you want to accomplish anything, you need to get in the flow. I suppose, I, I, I never considered myself that, but the more I, the more I read uh, Tao Tse Ching, the more I realize maybe I'm, a, I'm actually a Taoist. I, I think you, you've got to find the flow of life and get in it and work with it, rather than try to fight it. And so that tends to be my philosophy, and that's, you'll, you'll see that in what I present. I think as a beekeeper, you need to decide what your philosophy is, and you need to work with solutions that are in tune with your philosophy, because the reality is, you can make anything fail, and you can make anything succeed, and a lot of it's going to have to do with your attitude, whether you actually believe in what it is you're doing, and whether you're, gonna, whether you're going to follow through with that. And frankly, if you, if you don't believe in natural things and treatments, and you're really into modern medicine and antibiotics and better living through chemistry, you may not find natural beekeepings for you because you just can't really trust it. You got, and you've got to, you, you really, if you're going to work with nature, you need to trust it. But um, anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little right now about uh, four simple steps to healthier bees. Um, My first step is no treatments, which seems counterintuitive counter when you're talking to people who think the treatments are how you keep bees healthy. Um, but I really think it's a very important step for a bunch of reasons. One of them is kind of what I mentioned a minute ago, which is the ecology of the hive. There are, you know, we, we are all obsessed about mites. The fact is there's about 30 different kinds of mites that live in and on bees in a natural beehive or at least they did until the world got obsessed with killing mites and we dumped all these poisons in the hives. But there used to be about 30 different kinds of mites that live in the beehive. Um, in fact, the, the <coughs> scientists pretty much believe that one of those is the one that became the tracheal mite. It used to be totally benign, wasn't causing any problems, and it, and it started, and it moved into the trachea of the bee back in the 20s or so. And since then we've had tracheal mites. 
but there's 30 different kinds of mites and only two of them are a problem. At least here. There, there's one other kind of mite that's a problem for me somewhere else that hasn't got here yet. And we hope it never does, but um, there's over 30 different kinds of insects that live in a typical bee colony. If you've ever taken bees out of a tree and you pay attention to what you find in there and what you find in the detritus at the bottom, you find ants, you find little beetles, you find little tiny things that you can't even tell what they are, but you can tell they're there and they're moving around, and they're probably some kind of debris mites that live in the debris. And you have wax moths, you have greater wax moths and lesser wax moths, and you have ants and roaches and beetles and all sorts of things that live in this ecology that we call a bee colony. Some of them are big enough we can see them, but 8,000 of them are microscopic. There's 8,000 microorganisms so far that they've identified in the beehive, and they never really got serious about even attempting to identify them until CCD came along. And since then, they've identified more than 8,000 of them that, that live in a bee colony. Um, so what's the effect of treating? You know, the interesting thing is the most recent study on this shows that um, using Fumadil to try to prevent Nosema makes them susceptible to Nosema because it disrupts the biofilm of lactic acid bacteria that live in their gut. This lactic acid bacteria makes a film like, a, like the scum you see on, if you ever make sauerkraut, <laughs> get this kind of a scum on the top, that's actually a colony of bacteria. Um, well, there's a colony of bacteria that lives in a healthy bee's gut that, that coats the whole inside of their gut and protects it from things like Nosema. And fumadil is an antibiotic, and it tends to disrupt those. It doesn't really kill them off as bad as teramycin does. Teramycin will actually wipe them all out. But um, teramycin, of course, kills microorganisms. Fumadil kills mostly yeasts and fungus, but it's not it's not friendly to uh, bacteria either. Um, teramycin, of course, kills bacteria mostly. Essential oil is pretty much a broad spectrum. I don't know how many of you ever use them for for actual people medicine or whatever, but essential oils pretty much are the defense system of the plant. The plant creates these to defend itself against microorganisms. And we've concentrated it down and distilled it down, and it pretty much will kill fungus, it will kill yeast, it will kill bacteria. Um, you know, everybody thinks it, it really matters which essential oil. Well, it, it might for other effects, but as far as the effect of killing bacteria and fungus and, and viruses, pretty much all essential oils from all plants will do that because it's their defense system. Organic acids tend to, if you put them in a colony, they tend to kill off a lot of uh, microorganisms, pretty much broad, spe broad spectrum again, because um, they, they actually affect whether they can live there or not. I mean, uh, uh, bacteria always live in a very narrow pH. Um, they thrive in a narrow, very narrow pH. Sometimes they can live a range outside of that, and then a range outside of that, they die. So. When you put organic acids in, you tend to kill off all the yeasts, all the funguses, all, and all the bacteria again. At least the ones that were there. You may make it now a place where other ones that didn't used to live there can now thrive, but you probably kill off the ones that are there. Um, the caricides, of course, are, are just a fancy way uh, of, of relabeling insecticides and, and saying that we were using them to kill mites. Um, because organophosphates are insecticides, and we relabel it and call it check mite and pretend it's, a, it's not an insecticide, it's an acaricide. Only because of our intent, not because of what it is. It is an insecticide, and it's going to kill off a lot of the insects that are living in the colony, as well as all those other 30 mites that were actually benign and or maybe beneficial. One of the things you find when you start looking at the ecology of life is that almost anything that you consider benign is actually beneficial because it fills a niche. It fills a niche in this, in this ecology that will get filled with something else if you kill it off. So even though it doesn't seem like it does anything beneficial, it does something beneficial simply by being there and filling that gap. So um, here's, here's some beneficial organisms. How about chalkboard spores? That's a beneficial organism because it crowds out EFB. Um, of course, we don't usually consider it a beneficial organism if it gets the upper hand and it starts to overtake other niches and then we start having problems. But the, the fact is a lot of times uh, even, a, even a, a pathogenic problem is actually beneficial if it's in its, if it's, in its niche. And 
doing what it should be. Um, so anyway, there, uh, we know there are other bacteria that crowd out EFB and AFB, and actually that biofilm that lives in the gut of the bee that we talked about earlier tends to create an environment that's not conducive to AFB. So of course when you take care of myosin, you kill off that environment in their stomach that, that tends to kill AFB, you make them susceptible to AFB. So I'd say probably the leading cause of AFB is teramycin. But um, stone brood toxin, by the way, is what fumadil is. They take stone brood, which is a disease of bees, and they culture it in the lab, and they extract the toxin that it produces, and that's what fumadil is. Um, so actually, having stone brood in your colony might actually be helping prevent nosema, for all we know. Um, we do know that the natural flora of the gut creates a film that protects it from pathogens, including Nosema. Uh, if you go to Google and look up uh, uh, look up bees and symbionts and biofilm, and, and you'll come up with this this study, the most recent study on that. Um, we know yeast and bacteria are necessary for the formation of bee bread. So this is another one of those myths that most beekeepers believe. You probably think that bees can eat pollen, and they can't. What they can eat is bee bread, and what they need to make bee bread is pollen and the appropriate microorganisms to ferment it and the amount of time that it takes to ferment it. So if they take pollen and they mix it with enough nectar and they, and, and they inoculate it with the, the things that they have in their gut that they need to put in it to make the bee bread, then they can make bee bread. If they can't make bee bread, they can't digest pollen. It's, it's indigestible. It has a, a solid shell on it that they that their digestive system can't break down. So um, we know we know those are necessary in the hive. So I talked a little about this, but you really need to grasp that not only do benign organisms crowd out pathogens, but pathogens crowd out pathogens. You have living on your skin Staphylococcus aurea. And if you don't have living on your skin, then you'll get fungus living on your skin and you'll probably eventually die if you don't get staph growing on your skin again to displace the fungus. Um, you need staph living on your skin, but the fact is if you get a cut and that staph gets to living in the cut, it becomes a pathogen and now you have a staph infection. Well, a staph infection is not a good thing, but staph living on your skin is a good thing. You need it. So just because something can be a pathogen in one instance doesn't mean it's not actually beneficial in, an, in another place, in another when everything's in balance. So, the number one reason I had there for, for not treating is you need to maintain that rich ecosystem of the hive. You need all of those microorganisms and all of those insects and all of those mites and all of those things that are supposed to be living there. Number two is you need to put the selective pressure where it belongs. As long as we keep treating, then we're not allowing selection for the things that we need. We keep basically propping up genetics that can't survive the problems that we have, and we keep perpetuating those problems because we keep perpetuating those genetics. Um, if you don't treat, it's very easy to re breed for resistance to anything because if you breed from the ones that are healthy when you're not treating, you're breeding for resistance to all the problems you would have. It's not, it's not rocket science. I, I, I'm always kind of baffled by the breeding programs that, that um, all these scientists come up with because they always want to pick this one little trait that they think is the solution for this one little problem and they want to breed for this one little trait they do a whole bunch of inbreeding in order to fix that <laughs> which pretty much eliminates the, the depth of the gene pool and then they breed from that and, and try to bring out this one little trait that they think is going to solve the problem well the, the reality is it's not, it's not that complicated to breed for what you really need if you're not treating them and they're doing well, those are the ones you want. And, and really, I don't think you can find one trait or even map out all the possible combinations of traits that it takes to make a good, healthy colony. But you can easily choose them by looking and seeing what you're getting. Yes. Michael, for those new beekeepers in here, they may not know what AFB and EFB is. Um, AFB is American fowl brood, and EFB is European fowl brood. Um, a, a brief description of AFB. AFB is uh, kind of the terror of all beekeepers <coughs> because it produces spores that basically will live for probably forever. They've been trying to figure out how long they'll live and they started trying to track that about 75 years ago and so far the spores 
that they started tracking from 75 years ago are still viable, and they assume they'll probably still be viable for another 75 years, but nobody knows yet. But, but basically, I think you can assume they'll live forever. The spores will, but, they, but they're in a dormant state. The live bacteria doesn't live so long. So the reason the FB is so scary is that the typical treatment in most states seems to be you burn the hive and you burn the bees because you don't want to risk those spores. Um, of course, that's all. I, I won't get into AFB any more than that, but EFB is, uh, AFB tends to kill them after they're capped. If you're looking for AFB, you look for sunken cappings, pierced cappings, you stick a stick in there, you stir it around, you pull it out, and it'll string like, like snot, you know? And that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good evidence that you probably have AFB. And, and I would definitely get it tested more. Um, EFB tends to kill the larva before it gets capped. It tends to get sick and it tends to die before it gets capped. Once in a while they'll get capped before they die, but for the most part they tend to die before they get capped. Um, and then both of them are the larva dying. It's just when the larva dies and from, and from what. Um, of course we will see the tracheal mites and nosema. Nosema, in case, in case you don't know, is a... It, they used to call it a... a um, an amoeba, I believe, but now they've decided it's a microsporidia. They, they've taken microsporidia and put it under the under fungus now. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's still the same creature. Basically, it lives in the gut of the bee and it, and it weakens the walls of the guts of the bees and, and shortens their lives and makes it hard for them to digest their food. Um, anyway, as long as you keep treating, not only are you putting selective pressure on the bee in the wrong direction. Basically, you're propping up weak bees, but you're putting selective pressure on the pathogens and the pests because now the only pathogens that survive are the ones that are tough enough to survive your treatments. And the varroa that survive are the ones that can reproduce fast enough to still maintain their population while you're treating and killing them all off. And that's really the opposite of the selective pressure you really want. So basically, you end up creating this artificial system that the whole balance, the whole, the whole precarious balance of it is being maintained by the chemicals you're putting in, and you're never really selecting for, for the bees that can actually maintain a balance on their own. My third reason for not treating is you need to keep the combs clean of chemicals. Um, The, the wax in the hive is is basically a, a complicated fat. You know, it, it's it's uh, and most of the carcides we're using are lipophilic. That means they love fat, and they absorb into the wax and they stay there. And really, about the only thing that breaks them down is ultraviolet light. And how much ultraviolet light is there in the hive? And not much. Um, so then, of course, not only does that build up in your hive, but then they take that, everybody sells their cappings, they sell whatever, and they reform that into foundation, and then they sell you foundation, and the foundation's contaminated. Now it used to be, I used to think that the cappings were reasonably clean, because they should be putting the chemicals in the, in the brood nest, not the cappings. But the guy who does all the testing for all of this kind of stuff, for all the researchers at Penn State and some other places, I heard him speak, and he says actually there's a there's a vapor pressure on these on these chemicals, on the kumafos and the fluval fluvalinate in particular, and in a very short amount of time, there's the same amount of contamination in every bit of wax in the entire hive. It all evens out very quickly, and that actually scared me because I always assumed it would pretty much stay put. I figured it would stay where it was. I, I never thought of it migrating like that. But he said they did experiments where they would pull every other comb out and put clean, just empty combs in and let them draw their own wax and then they'd take that out and test it and it would be just as contaminated as the one next to it after it would had been in there for a while. Where you could put them all, all the bees on just empty combs and let them draw with wax, it would be clean. So it's getting the it's absorbing the chemicals from the from the comb next door. Um, so the only way really to have clean wax in your hive is to let the bees build their own comb. 
And, but you also have to stop treating. Um, my fourth reason is some of these chemicals do this at, at various degrees, but chemicals are a lot of how they communicate in the hive. They give off pheromones, and these pheromones are how they communicate what needs to be done or what, what the status of the hive is or, or uh, other things like that. And all of, all of these chemicals tend to interfere with the sense of smell. I don't know how many of you have ever used thymol and drive them right out of the hive. Uh, hot parts are pretty similar, I guess, uh, except that it makes them angry and drives them out of the hive. <laughs> but, um, the lemongrass oil, of course, is actually almost a dead ringer for nazanol pheromone, and that's why it works so well for swarm lure. A lot of people are putting it in their syrup and putting it in there to try to treat for various things. But well, you're basically simulating a pheromone that the bees make, so you're, not, you're interfering with their communication. Um, I mean, if, if you smoke a hive, I don't, you'll notice 10 minutes later, they're getting over it. But when you put a bunch of essential oils in there and they've stored it away in the wax, they're not going to get over it anytime soon. It's going to be interfering for quite some time. Um, so, you know, we often think that the bees do their little dance and everything and the other bees watch them. They don't watch them. They can't even see them. They, they, it's dark in there. <laughs> they, they do get clear up where their antennas are just touching them while they're doing their little dance. If you've ever watched... Next time you see a film where they're showing you a film of them doing the dance, you'll see at least one or two bees that are up there with their antennas touching them the whole time they're doing that dance um, because it's dark and that's how they communicate. Um, so smell is how they know when there's a queen, it's how they know that the brood needs to be fed, it's how they know that they need to go get more pollen, it's all of those things are communicated by pheromones. Um, also that's how they go find nectar. If you have really strong smells in the hive, how are they going to come back and recruit anybody to go find that wonderful flower that they just found out there when all they can smell is formic acid? Um, so what are the downsides of not treating? Um, well, obviously some of them are going to die off. What I can run into more and more when I go to beekeeping meetings everywhere are people who lost all their bees when they were treating, lost them all again when they were treating, quit treating and now they're losing a lot less of them and, and they're wondering why they ever did that in the first place. Um, the fact is I think they're already dying. I don't think you're going to lose any more or less. Um, but if they do, you really didn't want that gene, those genes anyway and if they survive then you get the genes you want. And if you just try to make enough splits to make up the difference, you can break even on the deal. Um, so what are the advantages to not treating? If you don't use any treatments, you don't have to buy the treatments. And I realize from the little hobbyist who has two hives, I don't think that's significant, but when you get to 200 hives, it's pretty significant. When you get to 10,000 hives, it's really significant. Um, when you get to 10,000 hives, it's the difference between sending your kid to college and not. And that's in one year. Um, you don't have to drive out to the yards to put them in. To me, that's a lot of work. And then you don't have to drive out to the yards to pull them out. And by the way, I noticed that most of you aren't pulling them out because I've seen your hives after they die and you're going through them and those strips are still in there. I have no idea how long they've been in there, but they're all propolized up. Um, you shouldn't do that. If you're going to treat, you should follow the directions because you're just contributing to resistance to that treatment by leaving them in there. Um, you don't contaminate your wax, you don't upset the ecosystem of the hive, you can breed for bees that survive, you can breed for mites that can live in balance. So that was point one, no treatments, right? Now we're on point two, breeding local survivors. Um, I, I think it's a really bad idea to keep bringing, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not guilty of having done it too, but um, you need bees, you get bees wherever you can get them, right? But we keep bringing bees from Georgia to wherever, or California to Nebraska, and they do really well in California. Actually, they probably did really well for people who are trying to get a whole bunch of bees way too early in the year, which isn't really what I want in Nebraska. Um, but they, they don't really do well. I, I really, 
My biggest problem once I got past the Varroa issue, which we'll talk about a little more as we go here, but my biggest problem was getting through the winter. Because, and I think that's a lot of that's genetics. You need bees that can get through your winters. An awful, an awful lot of what the bees do and the decisions they make um, are, 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 are not just controlled by what's happening now. The bees are trying to guess what the future holds. And in the process of guessing what the future holds, sometimes they make good decisions and sometimes they make bad decisions. They, they're all gamblers. They have to gamble in order to have enough bees when the flow hits to put up enough honey to get through the winter. So they have to try to predict the future. And I don't think bees from Georgia predict the future of winter very well in Pennsylvania. I don't think bees from California predict the future of winter in Nebraska very well. I think the, the instincts to do, to do that at different times probably are variable and they, and, and they should stay in the gene pool, all of those possibilities, so that the ones that do well in your climate tend to survive. Maybe there will always be a few that are stupid. And that's kind of a survival mechanism because if they ever end up in Georgia, it might work out well for them. But, um, but I think you need to breed from the local bees that are surviving your conditions, and you're going to get bees that do better in your conditions. Um, in the challenges of your area may not, they may be, they may be a lot of different things. They may be when the flows hit. I mean, Michael Palmer said until he started raising his own things, he never had bees that would build up at exactly the right time to hit all of his flows. It, it amazed him. He didn't think it was it would be that easy. But really, just from reading from the ones that did well where he was, he read from the ones that build up at the right time to hit those flows. And you, you realize if the bees build up too early, they have a bunch of mouths to feed, and the flow isn't here, and they starve. If they build up too late. And the flow's over before they get built up, and now they have a bunch of mouths to feed, and the flow's over, and they don't have anything to eat them, and they starve. So what you want is bees that build up at the right time, hit that flow, and make a bunch of honey. But also, bees that are tough enough that they, that they can survive in winters. So it's kind of the two of those. But anyway, he never really saw them build up at the right time until he started raising his own. So instead, you're out there trying to fool them into building up at what you think is the right time, and... and uh, I think you're better off with bees that already know how to do what they need to do. Um, if you raise your own queens, and you raise them from local survivors, you, you can raise them at the time to get optimal queens. You know, they, they did a study, they were trying to find really good genetics, you know, USDA was doing this in cooperation with some college, I'm trying to remember who all was involved now. I think, I think Steve. Tabor was one of the people involved, but anyway, they were looking, they, they had people send them queens from all over the country, and they put them in hives, and they, they rated how they did, and then they, then they, you know, tried to raise some queens from them, and so on and so forth. Well, they found this one guy who was sending them queens that were just really awesome, and they kept trying to breed queens from his queens, and they were just kind of mediocre, so they'd have them send them some more queens, and they were just really awesome, and they tried to breed queens from them, and they were kind of mediocre. So finally, they had to conclude it was how he was raising his queens that was making them good queens, not the genetics of the queens. And I think that's true. If you want really good queens, how well they're fed is more important than their genetics. And having them bred at a time when there's plenty of drones out there for them to breed with has more to do with them being successful than the genetics. I'm not saying genetics isn't important. I think it is. But I think it's really not as important as how well the queens are fed when they get bred. When you buy queens from the south, they're trying to raise them as early as possible to try and meet this demand for all these queens out here. And they can't really raise them at the optimum time. They're trying to raise them before the optimum time. And that's one of the reasons your queens keep going downhill. Plus the demand keeps going up. Plus the kumafos keeps building up in the wax, which makes them more sterile, so on and so forth. But all in all, queen, queen quality keeps going down. And the only way to get really good queens is to raise your own and do it at the optimum time. Do it when they're raising a lot of drones, right when they would have swarmed, and there's lots of food out there, so the queen gets fed well, and there's lots of drones out there, so she gets mated well, and you can have some really awesome queens. Um, another issue is, is if you raise your own queens, you can actually never cage them at all. You can, you can raise your queens, and they're in the mating new lane, and when you introduce them to the hive, you just... You, the way Brother Adam always did it, when he was going from a mating new to a hive, he'd just pick up the whole comb with the queen, after he's dequeened the other hive, just pick up the whole home and stick it in the hive. 
He said he never had any acceptance problems because the queen that's already laying, she's walking around with her red and egg, she's already laying, we put her in there, they're perfectly happy with her. She's been in a cage for three or four days, hasn't been laying, she's not making as much pheromone and we put her in there. They, they just say, who, who the heck are you? And kill her. Um, but you can get better ovarial development because if you interrupt their ovarial development, when they first start to lay some eggs, they're in a mating nuke, or, or, or you've introduced them to your hive yourself if you're raising them, you're raising your own, you could have just put the cell in there to reclaim them. But let's say they're in a mating nuke, they, they come out of the cell, they start, they, they mate, they just start to lay some eggs. A typical commercial bee, beekeeper selling queens is gonna grab that queen the second she's laid a couple of eggs. Basically, they're gonna put her in the mating nuke, they're gonna, gonna come around in two weeks, if they see one egg in that hive, they're gonna stick her in the cage and ship her. Well, if you interrupt her right when she just started to lay, her ovarials have just started to develop. And, and as soon as you put her in that cage and she stops laying, then they stop developing and they never develop. <coughs> That's it. They're done. If you let her lay for a couple of weeks, they continue to develop and reach their full potential. And then you cage her and then you ship her and she'll actually reach her full potential. Now, I'm not saying these guys are trying to cheat you. They're trying to put their kid through college. They're trying to pay their bills. They can't really have that mating week sitting around for another two weeks. They, they'd be making half as many queens if they did that. They can't afford to make half as many queens and still pay their bills. So I'm not saying they're, they're purposely doing a, a poor job. I'm just saying they can't afford to do a good job, and you can. You, you've got the time to do it, and your queens are too important to, to put that in the hands of somebody who really doesn't have a stake in how good your queens are. Um, so, also that tends to make a longer-lived queen because she ends up with well-developed ovarials. You did it at the outcome of time, so she got fed well and she got mated well, and, and she's going to tend to have good longevity if you don't have a lot of chemicals in the hive. Um, the average queen back in the old days, used to be, they used to live to three or four years old, and then they probably get replaced because they run out of eggs. The average queen today, according to Nancy Ostagai at Penn State, uh, is she thinks the average queen gets superseded three times a year. Um, but if you breed from bee queens that have longevity, I think you'll have less issues. Another thing is, if you breed from queens, from, from colonies that have been able to requeen themselves, see, in the wild, this is, this is automatically selected for. If a colony starts to fail, what do they, you know, the queen starts to fail, what do they do? They replace the queen. And if they sense that early enough, and they replace her early enough, and they do it in a way that's seamless, or they raise a mother queen, they, the, the, the mother's still there, they raise a queen from her, and now the daughter's there. The daughter starts laying, and then eventually they get rid of the mother. That's a seamless supersedure. There was no, there was no lull in there. There was no gap. There was always a laying queen in there. Um, if you breed from those kind of hives, you can get queen, you can get bees that know how to do that. If you keep requeening for them, there's no selective pressure for that. In nature, there is, but. In your colonies, if you reclean them every year, there's no selective pressure for that. You're, you're, now take, you're now doing all the supersedures for them. They're no longer responsible for it. And so you, you may end up with bees that don't know how to replace a failing queen. Um, of course, obviously, you save money by not having to buy queens. But the other thing is, if you keep some nukes around, you keep some spare queens around, um, you have a queen whenever you want one. Instead of, I'm, oh no, one of my hives is queenless. I'm scrambling trying to find someone who can sell me a queen right now. I just go get one out of one of my nukes and give them a queen. Um, the other thing is, if you do this, you'll be contributing to the overall genetic diversity of the honeybee in North America, and you may actually be contributing to honeybee's survival. Because uh, we keep narrowing the gene pool because we only have a few queen breeders raising queens. They're all raising it from a very narrow gene pool in the first place. And then they raise 100,000 bees that are all basic queen bees that are basically sisters. Ship them all over the country. It, 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 bee biology is all stacked toward diversity, genetic diversity. And our queen rearing practices are all stacked towards limiting the gene pool. Um, this is a quote from Randy Oliver, if you're not part of the genetic solution of breeding mite tolerant bees, then you're part of the problem. 
I think that obviously what he's thinking is if you if you keep perpetuating bees that can't tolerate mites, then you're just you're just putting those genes out there, which water down all the genes of the people who are trying to solve the problem. Um, if you live, you don't live in an aftermized bee area, I'll skip this. But um, so my third point is natural food. Um, There's plenty of studies out there that show that bees that are raised on pollen substitutes don't live long. Um, and yet they seem to sell pollen substitutes like crazy. Another thing that baffles me is it seems to be a recent trend that all the bee supply places are trying to sell new bees who are buying packages pollen substitutes. I don't understand. By the time you get a package, there's pollen out there. Why would you buy a pollen substitute? Why, why, don't you just, why don't you just invite the small high beetles and put it out in their smorgasbord for them? Oh, I mean, that's what you're doing anyway, so, but, but, really, I mean, it's inferior food, and you're not going to eat it if you if there's already pollen out there, and then, uh, and then, the, but the small hive beetles sure will, um, but anyway, I wouldn't use it just because I don't want short-lived bees, not to mention, I don't really want to throw them out of sync with their environment, I think when there's pollen available is when they should be getting it, so that they build up at the right time to hit that flow, but, uh, so that's all I'll say about pollen. Let's talk about sugar syrup. Um, I'm not sure what all the reasons why sugar syrup is inferior to honey are. I know the beekeepers have been observing it for at least 100 years because I can come up with a, dozens of quotes from Doolittle and Miller and Jay Smith and, and, and others who obviously all believe that sugar syrup is inferior food for bees compared to honey. But one of the well, actually, I do know one of the reasons. I don't know exactly the reason it interferes with it, but there is a study now that shows that sugar syrup disrupts that biofilm we were talking about earlier that protects the bee's gut. So sugar syrup is actually going to make them more susceptible to AFB, EFB, and nosema that we know of, that they've, that they've done research on. Yes? Sugar... I'm not sure I heard all of it. Um, isn't sugar syrup supposed to mimic a necrophilus? So how does it compare to the It depends on what level you want to look at. If you want to look at the 90% the of, of, of what honey is, is, is well, well, let's stick with nectar. 90% of what nectar is, other than you know, leaving out the water and looking at the other constituents, is mostly sucrose. Sugar syrup is mostly sucrose, um, but um, and, and and that's why really if you if you're going to feed something other than honey to bees, sugar syrup is about the best you can do because and, and just plain white sugar is probably about the best you can do because the, the problem with uh, most organic sugar they try not to to refine it you know and frankly that's good for people. The problem is it has solids in it that aren't good for bees, and the advantage to sugar syrup is that you've refined it more and gotten all those solids out, and so it's pretty much pure sucrose. But nectar isn't just pure sucrose. Nectar, nectar has a whole bunch of organic acids in it. It has, uh, it has several other sugars, maltose, sorbitol, not in great amounts, but it, it has uh, a whole lot of other complicated sugars in it. It has some trace minerals in it. It has, um, it probably has some of the essential oils of the plant in it, just to give it the, the smell. Um, obviously, if, if uh, well, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But one of the main differences is the pH. Sugar, when sugar is a pH of about, it's pretty much neutral at 6.0. Honey tends to run around 3.2 to 4.5. I don't know that nectar is that high because there are a couple of things that change along the way. One of those is the lactic acid bacteria in the stomach of the bee probably adds a little bit of acid to it. Plus you've already got some of the uh, other um, organic acids that are in the nectar. Usually, usually honey has some, some malic acid, usually has some oxalic acid, it usually has a little formic acid, it usually has quite a few bits and pieces of organic acids that it got from the plant. Um, and those tend to make it more acidic 
So basically, sugar is less acidic than, than nectar and honey. And I think that's the reason that the sugar sort of disrupts that biofilm in the gut, is partly the pH. But it's also partly um, that it's lacking some of the other things that are in the honey, that are in the nectar. Um, so what, I'm just picking on one, one issue that's, that's easily measurable that's different between honey and sugar syrup. Um, honey is more acidic, and if you look up all the brood diseases and how to culture them, AFB, EFB, all of those things, uh, a chalk brood, um, if you want to try to culture them, you need a pH of 6.0. You don't want a pH of 4.5. In other words, you want the pH of sugar if you want to try to grow them, and you don't want the pH of honey because they don't grow very well in honey. Um, this is a quote from Jay Smith on, the, he used to raise bees in Indiana, and then he moved to Florida and raised bees in Florida. And, was observing the difference between uh, the incidence of American fowl brood and how much sugar syrup they were feeding. Um, I thought it was an interesting observation, and this is basically uh, an example of the fact that chalk brood grows better at, uh, at, a, at a neutral pH than it does at a, at a higher pH. And uh, you can find lots more of those if you want to look up pH, AFB, EFB, things like that. Um, if you look up pH, AFB, culture, you'll probably find how to culture AFB and it'll be a pH of 6.0. Um, now, there's, a, there's the other 8,000 more microorganisms. We were just talking about whether helpful pathogens live. The fact is all the rest of the microorganisms in the hive are affected by this. And now just now starting to do some research to measure that. The, the one I mentioned about the about the biofilm in the gut, that's a recent uh, a recent research paper, and it says that the sugar disrupts it. Um, back in the 70s, Martha Gillum said that the sugar disrupted the the bacteria that lived in the gut of the bee too, but nobody seemed to care. Uh, the downside of leaving honey for feed, if you do this, if you leave the honey instead of well, let, let's back up. Let's Let's look at what I'm saying. I, I, what I'm not saying is I don't I, I don't let bees starve. I feed them sugar before I let them starve. Um, but on the other hand, my management practices are that I'm trying to leave them enough honey and not have to feed them. And if I can leave them enough honey and not have to feed them, I'm going to have healthier bees. And if I have to feed them, at least they won't have starving bees. But um, they may not be as healthy as they would have been if they had enough honey, but the fact is they don't have enough honey, I'm going to feed them sugar syrup. Um, I, I, some years I buy no sugar whatsoever, and some years I buy a lot of sugar. Um, depends, on, depends on the year and how things went, but most years I don't feed. Um, but if you take into account, if the, if the plan is to leave them enough honey, and rather than harvest all the honey and try to feed them enough syrup to get through the winter, then it, you have to do the math on what that costs you. Um, but normally, people just tell me, "Well, the difference between the price of honey and the difference between the price of sugar—that's that's all that matters." Yeah, but you have to feed, and, you're, and your bees aren't going to be as healthy. You got to take all that into account. I, I got to make the syrup. I got to haul it out to the yard. I got to put it in the feeders. I got to try to prevent all the robbing I'm going to set off. I got to lose a few hives to robbing because I set off all the robbing. I've got to. Uh, Pull all the feeders off probably and double check them to make sure I manage to succeed in feeding them up enough because I stole too much of their honey in the first place. And uh, all that several trips to the bee yard, a whole lot of work to make the syrup and the cost of the syrup and the cost of the gas to haul it out there and the cost to heat up the water to dissolve the sugar in the syrup. But uh, I, I don't think I really come out ahead. Even, even if I was just looking at the money. The upsides of leaving the honey is I don't have any issues with, the, with setting off robbing. I, I think feeding is the leading cause of robbing. Um, I've never found a way to feed that some bees didn't end up drowning. Um, I've seen ways where lots of them drowned, or less of them drowned, or, or, or most of the time none of them drowned, but then once in a while you, know, you, you get the bucket or the jar on top and every once in a while something happens and they spring a leak and you have this whole soggy mess of dead bees in the hive. I would just as soon avoid all that. Um, it's a whole lot less work, obviously, 
not only do I save the work of making the sugar syrup and hauling it out there, but all the honey I left in this honey I didn't have to go to the work of extracting. <laughs> and yeah, I, if I was, if they didn't need it, I'd extract it, sure, but um, still, that's, that is labor I saved by not harvesting. Um, so less trips to the VR, less food diseases, and, and, and a healthier ecosystem in the hive. So that was three, I'm going to talk about four. This is the fourth simple step, and it's natural calm. I talked a little about the roar before. I never could solve my problem with roar until I got on small cell and natural cell. And I've done both, and I've done both a lot. Um, they all died until I did that. And really, that's all I changed that got them to start surviving. And then I started working on other things like getting bees that could survive the winter better because I was still losing some over, more than I wanted to over winter. Um, for those of you who have never seen a Varroa, those little circles are circling some Varroa. kind of looks like a little tick on the bee. Um, on adult bees, it kind of gets between the, the plates on their, on their exoskeleton there. And they get up under there, and they get their mouth parts connected, and they suck their blood, basically. It's called hemolymph. I don't know why they call it hemolymph instead of blood. It's, Still got heme in it. Anyway, um, it sucks. It sucks their heme one. Um, they, that's not how they reproduce. That's just how they survive until they can reproduce. And then they go in the cell, and just before it gets capped, when a larva is just about to get capped, and then it feeds off of the larva, and it lays an egg every 36 hours the whole time it's in there. And each of the first one's a male, and the rest of them are all females. And then there may there may not be more than one mite in there. So it's possible that there may there, that some of these mites, as they develop, may mate with a male that's not their full brother. So there is some genetic combinations going on. But most typically, it's real likely that they, there's only one in there, and that they're probably going to end up mating with their brother that was laid earlier. But every 36 hours, one's laid, and, and as, as they develop, they reach the point where they mate. And once they've made it, then they're viable, that if they come out of the cell, they can live. Now, there's a whole bunch of them in there that aren't viable because they never made it to maturity. By the time the bee emerges, there's usually only one or two or three viable varroa that made it through. The rest of them all weren't mature enough to mate, and so therefore they just die. They're not viable. Um, now, that's, that's the only thing I did that ever solved my rural problem without treating it. I looked everywhere for a solution to that. That's kind of a whole other topic in itself. So I'll just say it either helps or it doesn't. And if it does, you help with your rural problem. And if it doesn't, you haven't hurt your rural problem. The, the reality of this is that uh, a guy named Bedeau came up with this wonderful idea. Actually, I, I, I shouldn't quite say that. Bonet and Huber came up with the idea way before he did, that since large drones come out of large drone cells and small drones come out of small drone cells, maybe if you made the cells larger, you'd get larger workers. Huber tried to do that experiment, but he didn't, he didn't have any foundation, so he really didn't get it to work. Badeau had a foundation to work with, so he stretched the foundation to make the cells bigger, and he raised bees in them, and they were bigger, and he measured all the different measurements on them. The holy grail he was going for really was a bee with a tongue long enough to work red clover. Because red clover is a huge nectar source, and honeybees don't have a tongue long enough to reach it. And he was trying to get them big enough that they could reach it. The other theory is if I have a big bee instead of a little bee, it'll be able to haul more nectar. That's the theory. I don't think the theory ever panned out, but Bedo seemed to believe it. And he sold everybody else on it. And back in the early 1900s, they started increasing the size of the foundation. There's a whole bunch of uh, magazine articles from the bee journals of the time that have been reprinted on bee source. We'd like to go read them where all the people were arguing over whether that was a good idea or not. Um, and we should leave them the size they are. The people were enlarging them. But all the foundation, you realize everything was foundational. It's pretty much up until the early 1900s anyway. Most people weren't even using foundation. But the people who were making foundation were making it 5.08 millimeter was the cell size on those. Um, that was pretty standard at the time, although the Italians were making 4.4. Uh, most of it tended to be around 5.08. And 
The dough increased it all the way up to about 5.6, but what caught on and finally became the standard was 5.4. So you have a 5.4 millimeter cell where bees typically naturally build anywhere in the range from 4.4 up to 5.08 for a worker cell. We're now making them 5.4, which makes bigger bees. Um, now that's basically in three dimensions. If you look at the dog did the research on how thick they build the comb when the cell size is what size, and so the thickness gets deeper as the cell gets wider. So a 5.4 worker cell is actually 150% of the volume of a 4.9 worker cell of the total volume. Um, so basically they've created a bee that's half again as big as it should be. Um, and by should be, I mean by the way they are in nature before we mess with them. Um, I guess Bedeau thought they should be 150% of what they used to be. But, um, there's some other research on it if you'd like to read more into more about small cell and large cell and whether it makes them bigger or smaller. This is a fairly recent study. I think it was done about late 90s or early 2000. The one at the top there, the McMullen and Brown. Um, you can look all these references up on my website. That's uh, that's actually the page that's just on natural cell. But if you just go to the to Bush Farms, go to bees. On the left-hand side, you'll find all, all sorts of topics, and you can go to Natural Cell and get there too. But pretty much near the bottom of the page, I have a link to that, as well as other other old documents and whatever on, on the history of the cell size. Um, and, and while I'm on the topic, uh, I guess I didn't mention that. I, I have a website, I guess I got mentioned in the intro, but um, I have books back here for sale. The fact is, everything that's in that book is on the website. It makes me a pretty poor salesman, but, but you can read it all for free. If you really don't know what you think of what I have to say, you can go read it for nothing and, and see what you think of it. And you can always buy the book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. The only thing is it probably won't get signed, but um, anyway, um, that's on my website. Um, so let's make a few assumptions. I think it's a reasonable assumption that the, the, the proper size for a worker cell in a colony is something that the bees already know. Does that seem like a reasonable assumption? I think that's a reasonable assumption. Now you can get sidetracked on some of the regression <coughs> issues of the fact that, well, A, we've been breeding bees to be bigger, but B, a bigger bee tends to, you know, uh, they tend to base the cell size they're building on their body. You know, how many of you know what a cubit is? Anybody know what a cubit is? Yeah. You know, no, it was, all the measurements for the arc are all in cubits. Cubit is the distance from here to here. So I think that's kind of how bees build cells. They base them off of their body. So a large, a large bee may not build as small a small cell as their offspring might, but they'll, but they'll head back in the right direction. Um, so we'll assume the bees know how to answer the question, and, and if we let them, they will. Um, so I think, I, think the, I think whatever they build is probably the correct size. So, what's the disadvantage to use a natural comb? Um, I think the biggest disadvantage to, to use a natural comb for people is if they're already beekeepers and they're already used to using foundation, they have to change some of their habits. When I, I go to my bee yard with a bunch of people from the bee club and I show a, a new bee a frame and tell them not to turn it this way and this way, they usually don't. But I hand it to an experienced beekeeper, they don't even think about it because they always tip it up. To, they want to tip it up and get the light in it to see that egg in the bottom of the cell and the comb falls out because it's just attached at the top and, and it's not quite done yet on the bottom and, and it's just not strong enough to do that. So there's some habits you gotta change if you're an experienced beekeeper. If you're a newbie, you'll, learn, you'll probably break one off and you'll never do it again because you have no habits to break. You'll just remember, I'm not supposed to do that. But if you're an experienced beekeeper, you'll probably break quite a few of them off before you finally get it in your head to stop doing that. Um, you have to level the highs. I mean, that's a little more work for some people. I think you ought to level the highs anyway. The fact is, bees build comb naturally by hanging. So they kind of make their own plumb bob, and they build the comb straight up and down with gravity, which, from a Structural point of view makes sense because you can support a lot of weight if you go straight up and down, and if you go at an angle, it's not so 
strong, but they build it straight up and down. So the problem is if your height is like leaning a long ways, it could be leaning far enough that it starts on the top bar of this frame and ends on the bottom bar of the frame next to it because it's leaning so far. So it's a good idea to get the height level, but you gotta get the height level. And it doesn't really matter if it's leaning a little to the front so the water runs out of the bottom board or something like that, but, but the side to side with the frame like this, this, this frame needs to be plumbed this way. And that's a little more work. Um, all in all, though, I think it's less work. You know, if, if you do foundationless, I'll talk a little more about foundationless, but if you do foundationless and natural comb, you get clean wax, you get healthier bees, and you don't have to clean the whole frame up and wire it and put foundation in it and embed it, and I think that's a lot less work. If I go out to, a, if I go out to one of my bee yards and one of, and one of these one of these combs is all messed up. I just take my pocket knife and go like this and throw it out, put, put the frame back in, I'm done. Um, rather than take it back to the house and clean it up. And... So, part of the main issue here is that we get clean wax. Um, natural combs really the only way you can get clean, clean wax. We already talked about how the beeswax supply is all contaminated. Because the, bees, the beekeepers keep putting chemicals in the hives, and then it gets recycled in the foundation, and then it gets, even if you buy foundation, it's already contaminated. Um, and it's not just the on label things that it's contaminated with, there's a lot of those commercial beekeepers using a lot of things that are not approved for what it is they're using them for. You find a lot of amtraz in, in uh, foundation, and it's not, it's not an approved chemical, but it will kill for all mites. Um, so the only way you can really have clean wax other than natural comb is if you get a press and you collect your own clean wax and you make your own foundation, which is what Dee Lusby does. But I look at how many thousands of hours she spends making foundation. And, and Kirk Webster does the same. It just boggles my mind. Um, I don't want to work that hard. So, contaminated wax causes infertile queens, infertile drones. There's plenty of research on all this. You can look up uh, drone fertility and kumafos on Google and find probably 100 studies on the topic. Um, it causes frequent supersedures because the queens are infertile. They're trying to replace them. And all those supersedures cost time, especially if, they, if they're the kind of bees that want to dispatch the old queen. <laughs> Some of them will leave her around until the new one's laying. Some of them, you know, she lays two eggs and pff, she's gone. They don't put up with their, and then, then all their eggs are in that one basket of getting a, a new queen and getting her mated, or they're not going to survive. But uh, it also, also that those chemicals not only make the queens and the drones infertile, but it weakens the bees. So how, so how do you get natural comb? Um, if, I, I'm assuming in this case mostly that you're running the lines to a pie. People who are doing top bar hives are usually getting natural comb because they just have top bars with some kind of guide on them. Um, people doing worries usually have just a top bar with some kind of guide on them. Um, the ones out here actually have some side bars on them, but um, but I'm talking mostly about Langster because that's what most people are trying to do. And all of those are perfectly valid ways to get natural comb too. But you need some kind of uh, guide is the most important thing about getting natural comb that's movable comb. You need it in the frame so that you can pull it out because if it's running crossways and the frames are running this way, you're not going to be able to take your frames out. You're not going to be able to examine the combs. And in most states, that's illegal. If you can't examine the combs, the bee inspector can basically just burn your hive and call it good. So you want to be able to inspect the combs not only because I think you want to be able to, to manage your hive, but you also don't want somebody burning your hive because it doesn't meet the legal requirements. But if you need a comb guide, so that means you either you can take. It depends on what kind of what I do depends on what I've got. If I've got a wedge top frame, I take break the wedge out, turn it, rotate it on its axis this way, and nail it back in. And now it sticks down. 